Hey everybody, you are listening to Renewal Cast, a weekly podcast that features interviews, discussions, and teaching on various biblical and theological subjects. We do this because we believe that our minds are to be shaped and renewed by the life-giving and transforming Word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we pray that for the next few minutes as you listen, you will see Jesus more clearly. Uh, Today on the podcast, we are uh, starting to wrap up our series on eschatology, on the end times, and what we want to do in the next few episodes is give some historical context to this discussion. We've spent some time going through the the different views. We've given some of our initial thoughts on that, and now we want to give some historical perspective. So today, Donald Fairbairn is going to come on again and help us with this, and I hope you enjoy our discussion with him today. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Renewal Cast. We are here today and we are sort of wrapping up a series that we've been doing on eschatology. And one of the, the questions that has come up is what did the early church fathers believe regarding what was their view of eschatology? And Donald Fairbairn is with us today and he's going to, not going to, we're going to ask him this question and and see what he says about where the the early church was on this matter. And if I'm correct, I'm thinking you're going to say they were more of a historic premillennial bend. So we're going to get into this. But as we begin, would you just share with us? Thank you for being here, by the way. We really appreciate that. And would you just share with us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about where you are and in ministry wise? Thank you. It's good to be with you. Uh, This is the second time that I've joined you for the podcast, and so I appreciate the invitation to come back again. And as Colt said, my name is Don Fairbairn. I'm professor of early Christianity at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, and I am based at the Charlotte, North Carolina campus, although I teach at all the campuses of Gordon Conwell. I actually live in eastern Kentucky at the moment. Children go to college in eastern Kentucky and and so we moved here in order to keep the family together for a few more years. And I drive back to Charlotte once a month or so for classes and other meetings. And then I do other things online like I'm doing today. Sounds good. Let's just start our conversation this way. Why does it matter what people throughout history have thought on a particular subject? I mean, we're thinking we're talking about eschatology here, but Really, any? Why does it matter what the early church fathers thought about theology? Okay, that's a really good question to start with. And the short one sentence answer is at the end of the day, it doesn't matter, but it does matter. And what I mean by that is that ultimately, authority rests with Scripture. God has inspired Scripture in a direct way, in a way that He has not inspired any other writings, however valuable they may be. And so only scripture is ultimately authoritative in our understanding of Christianity and our understanding of life. So in terms of ultimate authority, it doesn't matter what the early church said or what the reformers said or what anybody else said. What matters is what scripture says. But at the same time, there have been a lot of Christians all through Christian history who have known the Bible really well and have studied it very carefully and have sought to articulate the Christian faith on the basis of Scripture as well as they could with the illumination of the Holy Spirit. And it is valuable for us to lean on them to pay attention to what they have said in order to help us in our understanding of Scripture as well. Not because what they say could take the place of Scripture, but as an aid to the understanding of the Bible. And so that, I think, is an appropriate way for us to affirm the inerrancy and unique authority of Scripture, to lean on Christians from all periods of Christian history to try to help us understand the the Bible better than we might otherwise do so. Sure. Is there a particular value to the Church Fathers? Well, that's also a really good question, because one of the impressions that we tend to have in our minds is that the closer people were to the time period when a writing was written, the more likely they are to be able to understand it well. So we tend to think that 
the understanding of Scripture in the early second century, shortly after the end of the New Testament, might have been almost perfect. And then it got worse and worse as time went on until something dramatic like the Reformation led to restoration, a really good interpretation of Scripture. It's possible that the pattern could work out like that, but not necessarily. Now, sometimes people who are closest to the event in time don't have enough distance for the kind of perspective that they need to understand the significance of what they have seen and what they've heard and what they've read. One example of that is that it's probably not a coincidence that the Holy Spirit inspired the gospel writers a generation or so, 20, 30 years or more, in the case of the Gospel of John, after the life of Jesus on earth because it took time to get the vantage point to be able to understand. So it is not automatically the case that the early church fathers would have understood something better than people in the year 500 or 1,000 or 1,500. But on something like eschatology in particular, what the first disciples of Christ after the New Testament would have been able to do would be to sustain the kind of attitude toward the second coming of Christ that the apostles have. It's easier to follow somebody in their practices and their attitude than it is necessarily to interpret what they've written with. And so we can be fairly confident that the the white hot expectation of the return of Christ in the second century is a result of the fact that it was just as white hot in the first century in the time of the apostles. And of course, we see that in the writings of Paul and elsewhere in the New Testament as well. So that kind of explains why there is always, it seems like in a conversation about eschatology and somebody's making their case for their certain view, an appeal back to the first, second century and say, well... Yes, yes, there is. There is an eschatology. In a sense, you have that in every aspect of theology. But one of the things that we kind of emotionally desire is what I call historical authority. And by that, I mean the idea that what we think didn't just get invented yesterday, that it's got this long pedigree of people saying the same thing we think. And so we want the reformers to have said what we say. But going back beyond that, we want people from the second, the third, the fourth century to have been saying what we do. I call that the desire for historical authority. And that's certainly true on eschatology as it is on other areas. And so people who have various different understandings of the millennium, for example, today, all want to claim that people in the early church were saying the same things that we're saying today. That's very, very common. Why did you want to study the church fathers? Like you spent, I mean, you're considered a church father expert, right? You spent, you've devoted your life to it. What made you want to do that? Okay, that's not a question I was expecting. I know. It's uh, it's not a difficult (laughs) one to answer, though. I finished seminary in 1989, expecting to be a New Testament scholar, expecting to go to do a PhD in New Testament. But in the meantime, the Soviet Union opened for ministry for the gospel, and I had an opportunity to go to Soviet Georgia for a year in 1990. And this was the year that all of the republics declared independence. It was a pretty striking time, exciting time to be in the Soviet Union. But when I was there, I came into contact not with an atheistic culture like I had been expecting, but with an Eastern Orthodox one. And I was very perplexed. Here was this very different kind of Christianity than the Western Christianity I was familiar with. But these people knew the Bible, a lot of them, they were devout, but they came at the Bible very differently than I did. And so I got very interested in Eastern Orthodoxy and did some study and eventually wrote a book on on modern Eastern Orthodoxy. And as I got interested in Eastern Orthodoxy, I also got interested in the question, where did the theological differences between the East and the West come from? And that's what led me back to the study of what we call the patristic period, the first several centuries after the end of the New Testament. It was an attempt to try to understand where we have come from as Western Christians and they have come from as Eastern Christians, on the other hand. Okay. Is there a consensus view then among the early church fathers? And what time period is that among eschatology? Yes and no. There's enough evidence. There are enough different views 
that pretty much whatever you want to say today about eschatology, you can find some people in the early church who said that. So in that sense, there's not, you know, there's not a uniformity. But the question is, how much of a consensus was there? And so if I can use the modern categories of amillennialism and premillennialism, and if everybody will understand what I mean by those, there are some people who say that you had a lot of both of those in the early church. And then by the fourth or the fifth century, amillennialism began to dominate. Okay, that statement on the face of it is true. It's certainly true that by the fifth century, amillennialism dominated in both the East and the West. In fact, by the fifth century, premillennialism was considered a heresy in the Eastern church, and it almost disappeared altogether. It never completely disappeared in the Western church. But from the fifth century until, oh, let's say the German peasants' revolt in the 1520s, early in the Reformation, amillennialism dominated the church. But the question is, was that the view of the earliest church, the second century, the third century? And if not, why did you have a shift from something else to amillennialism in the fourth and the fifth century? So was there a consensus? No, not a complete consensus. There certainly wasn't uniformity. Can you talk about a consensus after the year 500 or so? Yes, and it was amillennial. Can you talk about a consensus in the year 200 or so? That's a more complicated question, and I can get to that when we're ready for that. <laughs> so you think, so we'll, we've let the cat out of the bag already. You think they were more historic pre mill but obviously some disagree with you on that and would say the consensus was more in the amill position or some other option. What are the options, I guess? Well, if if you want to look at the second and the third centuries, recognize that most of our evidence about patristic eschatology comes from within the Roman Empire. Now, there's actually quite a bit of Christianity outside the Roman Empire in the early period, but we don't have as many writings from there and we don't have much evidence that I know of related to eschatology outside the Roman Empire. So what's the big thing that's happening politically in the Roman Empire? In the early fourth century, Christianity goes from being persecuted, a minority, to being the religion of the empire, to having a very close association with the state, with the Roman state. Another thing that's happening in the fourth century is that Christianity is being influenced more and more by the philosophy of the Greco-Roman world, which is fairly anti-physical, anti-material, exalting the spiritual realm above the physical realm. So both of those factors play into this emerging consensus of amillennialism in the fourth and the fifth century. As the church and the state become closely connected, the idea of Revelation 20 referring to this period of church-state cooperation leading to a golden age, a political social golden age, is very attractive. That's an easy way to read Revelation chapter 20 if you're living in the year 500 or so. But that's not a very easy way to read Revelation 20 if you're living in the year 200 or so. And so that brings me to one of the things that's worth pointing out, which is that every aspect of Christian theology is influenced not only by the Bible, but by the situation the interpreters are in as we understand the Bible. And that's especially true of eschatology. It is no coincidence that you have this movement toward an amillennial eschatology at exactly the time that the church and the Roman state are becoming very closely allied. People reading Revelation 20 in the year 500 are living in a very different situation than those in the year 200. And that's not surprisingly affecting the way they interpret Revelation 20. Now, does that mean amillennialism is wrong because it wouldn't have been likely to have arisen earlier? No, not necessarily. But you always need to think about the relation between what's in your head in addition to the Bible as you read the Bible. Yeah, so so thinking about that, those Christians that were living in in the year 200 and in that area that were facing persecution and, and some of those things that were going on, 
and they were looking forward to a millennial reign, a millennial kingdom. That that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think one of the questions that our, our listeners are going to come up with right away is, did those Christians that were in the midst of that situation think that they were going to go through a tribulational period before, or did they think that they were going to get rescued from that, like a, a modern day rapture? Was that anywhere in the picture during this time? Mm-hmm. Okay, yes. Very good question. First of all, prior to the conversion of the Roman Empire, say in the year 200 that we're using as an example, Christians in the Roman Empire are what they're looking for as they read the Bible is deliverance. They're looking for God to intervene in order to change the situation, which is difficult. It's not always terrible, but it's difficult for Christians all the time. And sometimes it's terrible for Christians in the year 150, 200, 250. So they're looking for God to intervene in history and change that. And so they're latching on to places where the Bible is talking about God's intervention in history, the day of the Lord. Uh, Zechariah 14, Revelation chapters 19 and 20 there. They're paying a lot of attention to those chapters. But this is where it gets interesting because you ask the question, and and so obviously that sort of inclines them toward what we call premillennialism. They called it chiliasm, uh, a belief in a thousand-year reign of Christ with believers after he returns. So our our name for that in Latin is premillennialism. Their name for that was chiliasm in Greek. So they're looking, they're looking at Revelation 20 that way. But you're asking a more specific question about that. You're asking a question about what we call the rapture and the tribulation. So in dispensational eschatology, as it is often depicted to us, you have a seven-year tribulation. And there's one chapter in the book of Daniel and several scattered statements in the book of Revelation that are the basis for the idea that it's going to be seven years. So there's a seven-year tribulation. At the end of that, Christ will return. So the question then of the rapture, which is described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, is the question, is Christ coming for the church and snatching the church up to meet him in the air, what we call the rapture? Is that going to happen earlier than his actual coming to earth? Or is that going to happen at the same time? So dispensational premillennialism, ordinarily, not always, but ordinarily, sees the whole seven-year tribulation period as being a time of the outpouring of God's wrath on the earth. And it sees 1 Thessalonians 4 as referring to God's taking the church up to heaven to be spared from that seven-year period. And then the believers will come back with Christ at the end of that period. So that's called a pre-tribulation rapture. So did did people in the early church affirm a pre-tribulation rapture? Yeah, the answer is very simple. Now, we don't have any evidence of anybody in the year 100 or 150 or 200, 250, 300 affirming a pre-tribulation rapture. And there are several reasons for that. And one of the reasons was that they didn't make a sharp distinction between Israel and the church, the way dispensational eschatology does. And another reason for that is that they didn't have any idea in their mind of God preserving the church from wrath or from suffering. Now, God preserves the church from his own wrath, but there was, for most Christians in most of Christian history, there's been an assumption that God allows his church to suffer the wrath of the world and to suffer greatly. And that was definitely the case for Christians in the Roman Empire in around the year 200. And so they saw the purpose of the tribulation as being to purify the church, to get the Christians ready to reign with Christ in the millennial kingdom. So they saw the tribulation not in terms of Israel, but in terms of continued purification of the church through suffering. So how did they understand 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? As far as we can tell, there there aren't a lot of places where they talk about this, but in the places where they do talk about 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the idea that they have in mind is the idea that the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air is so that the church can serve as a welcome party. 
In 1 Thessalonians 4, the word for meat that Paul uses in verse, I think it's verse 17, was a technical term that in the ancient world was used of a welcome party, that when a king, a foreign king is coming into a city, the welcome party would go outside the gates of the city and meet him out in the forest or the desert, as the case may have been, and then go back with them. It would be kind of like a diplomatic delegation meeting a dignitary at the airport today. That would be the equivalent and going back into the city with him. So that's the idea of the word that Paul uses there. And so when the early church does talk about 1 Thessalonians 4, the way they depict it is that we have the privilege to be the welcome party, welcoming Christ back to earth. So we go up into the air to meet him and come back down with him as he triumphantly returns to earth. And this happens after the church has been purified through the tribulation. So that's the way the early church understood uh, the rapture in relation to the tribulation from the evidence that we have. We don't see any evidence of anything like a pre-tribulation rapture in the writings of the early church. Yeah, I find that extremely fascinating. You know, just thinking about the, the context in which these were in, looking forward to that, but yet they saw themselves as the suffering that they were facing is, is purifying the church. They weren't looking for uh, escape. But you read a lot of uh, modern dispensational stuff in America, and the world is so bad now, God has got to come rescue us from that and take us out from that in a, a pre-tribulational rapture. The, the mindset, it seems to be now and, and then, was just totally different. Right, yes. Yeah. So they had a, a similarly bad world to live in. They had a tough, a very tough situation to live in, arguably worse in many ways. Um, but they didn't come to that conclusion. You know, they came to the conclusion, we need the refining work of the Holy Spirit, maybe even through the tribulation, to get us ready to reign with Christ. That was their attitude. And that attitude affects the way they look at, at those passages from Scripture. We're looking at your chapter in the book, this the case for historic premillennialism. Probably point that out to our listeners too, if they want to read more. You give another reason there why they weren't uh, dispensational, and that's hermeneutics. Would you talk to us about that a little bit? Okay. Yes, and I, I alluded to this just a minute ago, but in dispensational hermeneutics, one thing that's very central is a sharp distinction between Israel and the church. The biggest hermeneutical challenge that any of us face as Christians in any time or any place is what's the right way to relate the Old Testament and the New Testament? You know, the Old Testament is written mostly to Jews before the time of Christ. The New Testament is written after the time of Christ and mostly to Gentiles. And how are we going to put them together? And so the place where that question becomes especially intense and significant is when you start feeling the tension or apparent tension, let's say there aren't any real tensions in the Bible, you start feeling the apparent tension between promises made to Israel as a nation and what's going on after the time of Christ with the church. So the dispensational attitude toward those apparent tensions is always to take the Old Testament prophecies scrupulously, literally, but to say they don't apply to the church. Anything related, anything spoken of as being about Israel in the Old Testament is about Israel. If it hasn't been fulfilled yet, it's going to be fulfilled at the end of history after God finishes his plan for the church and then turns his attention back to Israel during the tribulation. But that's a a very strong hermeneutical attitude or predisposition that influences the way they read all of these relevant passages. Faced with the same apparent tension, virtually everybody in the early church made the opposite hermeneutical assumption. They assumed that every one of those passages referred directly to the church, even if it meant that they couldn't be taken scrupulously, literally, the way they were written in the Old Testament. So we've got the opposite set of hermeneutical assumptions with respect to eschatology and especially the theology of the tribulation on the part of modern dispensationalism from what you had on the part of the early church. 
the early church, more than almost anything else, wanted to see the whole Bible as a book about Christ. So every Old Testament passage got referred to Christ or to the church or to the individual Christian, or maybe all three. And if that meant they had to massage them a little bit because they were originally written for Israel, that's what they did. And that is the opposite of a modern dispensationalist saying, no, that refers literally to Israel, so it doesn't apply to us now. And God will come back and pick that up later. So those are very, very different hermeneutical assumptions. Now, when I say all of this, I'm not, I'm not saying this as a way of saying dispensationalism is wrong. It's important to take the Bible at face value with respect to its original audience as much as we can. But there's also the question of how you fit it all together. And the early church had a different way of fitting it together than most modern Protestants do, and certainly a different way than modern dispensationalists do. That's surreal. I liked your, your line there in the book, say, one cannot emphasize strongly enough that this hermeneutic is utterly foreign to the early church. The overwhelming concern of all Christian writers was to read the entire Bible as a Christian book. That's really appreciate that observation. Yes. For what it's worth, I should mention that I think there are better ways of seeing the Old Testament referring to Christ than some of the ways the early church does. I think the best overall schema would be to say, let's look at promise and fulfillment. And in the Old Testament, you have promises, specific promises, general promises, and they all ultimately find their fulfillment in what's going on with the incarnation in the New Testament and the church. I think you can do better justice to the plain sense of the Old Testament passages in that kind of scheme than the early church did. So this is a place where I'm not by any means agreeing with them completely. But I think they are right that we need to fit it all together and we do see it all in terms of Christ. I think they are right about that. Who would some of these church fathers be that we can read and, and see how they're talking about premillennialism? Would it be Irenaeus or Clement or who would we look to? Yes, if you're looking for what's typical in around the year 200 or so during, before the conversion of the empire, book five of Irenaeus's work against heresies would probably be the best place to turn. Now you can go to, there are five books in that mammoth work. I, I don't necessarily recommend that somebody jump in and read them all because the first couple of books are, are all about Gnostic systems and what's wrong with them. So it can be very, very tedious. Um, but books three through five are his positive treatment of Christianity. And book five deals with eschatology. So that's the best place. Uh, if you're interested in seeing what the church shifted toward in the fourth and fifth centuries, the amillennialism that came to dominate for some 1500 years, uh, the best place to go would be Augustine's City of God, book 20, about Revelation chapter 20. So it's coincidence that Book 20 of that work is about Revelation chapter 20. That makes it easier to remember the numbers, though. <laughs> um, I'm going to throw a, a question at you, too, that we didn't ask you but beforehand. But we mentioned that there was a shift from premillennialism to all millennialism in the, the fourth, fifth centuries there. What about postmillennialism? Is there any bit of that come along? Or where, when do we start seeing that optimism? Okay. Good question. And if I understand correctly, modern post-millennialists also point to Augustine. Um, Augustine's way of interpreting the book of Revelation provides a basis for seeing Revelation 20 not being written, Revelation 19 and 20, not being written in chronological order. And so to be an amillennialist or a post-millennialist, you've got to have a good justification for taking chapter 20 as not necessarily coming after chapter 19 in the book of Revelation. Uh, chapter 19 describes the return of Christ. Chapter 20 describes the thousand-year reign. So if you've you got to break the chronological link between those chapters. And Augustine provides the justification for both amillennialists and postmillennialists to break that chronological link. But in my opinion, as far as I know, the great heyday of postmillennialism was in Europe and America in the 19th century. And that's probably not a coincidence either, because the 19th century, especially in Europe, was the great period optimism, optimism about 
the human ability to usher in the kingdom of God. If you think, you know, what do we think of in the 19th century? Well, Charles Darwin's Origin of Species. Darwin is not the creator of these, this idea of an upward evolution. He's taking that idea that's in the air in the 19th century, and he's using it as the basis for his biological experimentation. The idea is already there. The idea of this upward advance of humanity, this perfectibility of the human race, eschatologically gets turned into the church ushering in the kingdom of God. And so the 19th century is really the heyday of an optimistic view of the human race and the church, which is conducive to a post-millennial reading of eschatology. Now, what shattered that optimism about humanity in America was the Civil War. But in Europe, it was World War I. So that kind of optimism persisted for what's that, 50, 55 more years in Europe than it did in, in America. And so a lot of great post-millennial thinking is coming out of the, the 19th century. And in, in, for example, in Presbyterian circles, you, found, you find a shift from a millennial to more post-millennial in the 19th century, if I remember correctly. That's also, interestingly, the time when modern premillennialism began to reassert itself dispensational style premillennialism also arose at the same time, partly as a rejection of the identification of the church with this upward progress of mankind that the mainstream thinkers were advocating for. Yeah, that's, that's good. So the context of the interpreter is always something that has to be factored in when understanding the way he interprets scripture. Any concluding thoughts that we should hear about the church fathers and their eschatology? Well, I, I haven't yet said the thing that is actually what I believe is most important. So how about if I talk about that now? The thing about premillennialism in the early church was that its major function was to assist in the battle against Gnosticism. Gnosticism was the great first and second century heresy. You could argue it's the great Christian heresy of every time period which sees the physical as being unimportant or evil, sees salvation as including only the spiritual, sees salvation as the escape of the soul or the spirit from the body, the escape from the physical world. Okay, that's been the most pervasive heresy throughout all of Christian history. And Irenaeus and Tertullian both used premillennialism as a way of fighting the battle against Gnosticism. One of the ways that we know that the physical is important to God is because there's going to be a physical kingdom in which God will reign with this believer. So it's much more important than just satisfying curiosity about what's going to happen at the end of the world. It goes together with the idea, along with the doctrine of creation and the doctrine of the incarnation and redemption, all of those fit together to emphasize the value of the physical world and the physical aspect of who we are as human beings. And so the most important thing, I think, for us to learn about the early church, uh, from the early church, about eschatology, is the value of being physical. However we get to the new heavens and new earth, whether premillennialism is right, or postmillennialism, or amillennialism, or something else we haven't thought of yet, however we get to the new heavens and the new earth, it is not that we are going to dwell with God up there. It's that God is going to dwell with us here on a restored, reconstituted earth as we are in our resurrected and restored body where everything is restored to the way it was meant to be as God created. And that will be physical as well as spiritual. And that's perfectly consistent with God's purposes all through Scripture. And it's crucially important for us to recognize that. We tend to think of heaven as being this ethereal sort of nothingness. But if you ask, where are we going to dwell with God in eternity? It will be here in the New Jerusalem on a, new, a reconstituted earth in what Isaiah 66 and Revelation 21 and 22 call the new heavens and new earth. And premillennialism can help us to focus our attention on the value of the physical 
and the importance of a physical kingdom in the purposes of God. Now, of course, an amillennialist, for example, can also affirm everything I just said about the new heavens and new earth being physical. So I, I'm not answering once and for all the question, which of those is right, but I'm trying to point to what's most significant about eschatology, which is the new heavens and new earth. Yeah, that's such a good place to kind of land on in all of this, because, you know, we're talking about different time periods and how different people saw it and what they're bringing into the whole discussion. And ultimately, wherever you land and wherever you're, whatever circumstances one finds themselves in, you know, the hope is that one day, you know, God will dwell with us, like you said, on a, a reconstituted new heaven and new earth. I mean, that's, that's just a tremendous uh, hope that we have, that one day he will come and set all things to, to rights. And Yes, yes, very good. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I really, uh, really appreciated our conversation today. It was very interesting, very helpful. So really appreciated it. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's good to be with you again. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. You can find more out about us or check out past episodes on the web at RenewalCast.com. You can connect with us on social media. For instance, you can go to Facebook.com slash RenewalCast. Have a great week. Have a great week.